Hello, everyone. My name is Nico Belmonte. I run the visualization and data engineering teams at Uber. And today I'm going to be talking about a paper that actually turns uh, 10 years today, well, actually last month, which is called Unfolding the Earth and uh, Myriad Hydro Projections in WebGL. So first of all, I'll go really quick through this because John already covered it, but I want to give a quick introduction in terms of like what the team does. Our skill set is around computer graphics, information design, and web engineering. I think it was a good breakdown by John on, on in terms of like backgrounds and nationalities and all that stuff. But first of all, why a visualization team at Uber? Like having a visualization team is fairly unique today. And we, you know, spend lots of resources processing and storing billions of data points every day at Uber. And visualization is a way to actually get insights and value from this data, mine this data in order to get some value from it. One example of it is enhancing the pickup experience at Uber. So we have here an example of like SFO and you have a writer that actually misses the driver. So the driver needs to do an extra loop to actually pick up the writer and then they go together on a trip. So before that, we had no insight into the anatomy of a missed pickup. But then there's like other types of visualizations that we do in terms of like aggregating billions of points and provide, you know, regional general managers and GMs with insights in terms of like demand and supply in their own region. So the team focuses on two main things, building visualization applications. As they build these applications, they find commonalities in code that they can extract and build frameworks out of. And so we've been doing a lot of framework development as well that we were able to open source because we have a, a great open source team at Uber. So we've developed DeckGL, LumaGL, and React MapGL. Last time I was presenting on a wind demo that it was using DeckGL, and then this time I'll focus more on like a Luma GL demo. The idea behind it is that although the paper is 10 years old, the visualizations are fairly novel. The idea behind it is that with most map projections, you have people assume that the material that you're using for doing mapping 3D globe to a 2D uh, plane is a stretchable surface, right? And so because it is a stretchable surface, you get all these distortions in the map, right? Either like area distortions or like angle distortions. And so what uh, Jar Van Quick did 10 years ago is to use a completely different physical model for the map projections, one that they could not be stretched and try to use ordinary projections with this model and then invent new ones from it. This is the whole challenge with map projections. This is a common Mercator projection that you'd be using if you'd use map box or use anything else and you think that Greenland is huge and then you approach it to the equator and then you figure out it's actually it's not that big as it's been shown and <laughs> and then that can be actually seen through the TSO indicatrix so the little image there shows you that there's a bunch of circles right and then as they go up to the north or south pole you get to see that the area of these circles increases you see that the shape of the circles are still circles that means that the angles are preserved right However, the area is not preserved. As you go up and down, there is a distortion that happens. And what we're trying to solve with this myriahedral projections is to provide map projections that will not have any distortion in them. Of course, there is a trade-off that we're doing at the expense of something else, but at least we can assure you that they will not have any distortions. This is a picture of Jack Van Week, I don't know how many years ago, but the cool thing is on the right, I think it's showing the trade-offs that you're doing when you create map projections. And up until myriahedral projections showed up, we only had this spectrum that is that horizontal line between conformal mapping, so maps that preserve angles, and then equal area mapping, maps that preserve area, but no angles. So on the rightmost side, we have the previous example that we showed before, the common mercator projection. So angles are preserved, area is distorted. As you move to the left of that spectrum, you get to see an equal area projection where we enforce that at any point of the map will have the same area. However, that comes at the expense of being non-conformal mappings. And then what he added is this third dimension where you're probably familiar with the dimension map, the Fuller, Buckminster Fuller map, where you have this like icosahedron element that you can unfold and then you have the land there. And if you're not familiar with it, we'll, I'll show it later, so it's fine. But as you do more and more cuts and it interrupts, you're able to have both equal area and angle projections at the expense of having multiple cuts in your map. Hopefully that was clear enough. This is a much more illustrative example 
So you have a bergamot or whatever, and you do a bunch of cuts. And if you do enough of them, then you can unfold them without having any area or angle distortion. That is a very skilled thing. So what are they exactly, myriahedral projections? So the idea here is you project the globe into this structure that we'll define later that's called a myriahedron. Just think of it as a graph and not a mesh, but a graph. And then you label the edges of this graph as cuts or folds. In this case, the red lines in that image are cuts. And then the folds are actually edges connecting multiple faces of this graph, which is called a dual graph. And then you calculate a spanning tree for this, and then you unfold the globe. So this tweet is pretty cool because it actually like summarizes with one tweet what it is. Van Wyck basically used a new physical model to illustrate traditional projections, but then he took advantage of this model to actually create new projections with it. And I think that that's what really, what's really uh, interesting and amazing about this. Myriahedron can be thought of, so what is this data structure, right? Like it's a graph, but okay, what is a myriahedron and why are we calling it this way? A myriad is a thousand or more things. Uh, in this case, we're creating a polyhedra with many faces, an infinity of faces, so that when you unfold them, you don't generate any type of distortion. There are many ways that you can create these sort of like spherical shaped myriahedrons. You could create one that follows like a graticule mesh, right? Like, so you cut on, you have edges on at the level of like parallels and meridians, right? But also another way of doing it is by recursively subdividing your objects, right? So you could have an icosahedron and then for each triangular face, you could divide that into like four other smaller faces and so on, like a fractal type. And then you get these sort of like other models for it. Given this physical model and all the possibilities in it, Van Wyck, the first thing he does is to explore like projections following a graticle mesh because they are the most intuitive or at least common projections that you can get to see. So from left to right, you get to see a polyconical projection, cylindrical projection, azimuthal projection, and two or bi hemispheres projection. So what's interesting about these projections is the fact that in order to build this spanning tree, so you have a tree that connects all the different faces, right, when you create those cuts. And all of these spanning trees are a little bit suboptimal in the sense that they're not balanced trees. You have one node, and then for each parent node, you only have one child node and so on. So this is why you get to see like this very uneven types of tree structures. So more than half of the project has been around selecting the right data structure for this. Once you find the right data structure for it, the rest of it develops pretty straightforwardly. So we chose this data structure that's called a quad edge data structure. And it's an evolved data structure from the half edge data structure. So if you've ever used the D3 Voronoi plugin to do some Voronoi stuff, you may have found that if you do console log, you'll find some half edge stuff. So half edge is a data structure that evolves from a doubly linked list, list evolves into half edge data structure, which has evolved into a quad edge data structure. And so I randomly found this and it was incredibly useful. However, it's like a 70 page paper that was written in 1985 it has these amazing like handwritten like pictures of things. So I would definitely recommend you to look at the images. Maybe don't read the paper, but I don't know. It's, it's really amazing to see how that was like handcrafted to explain all these different concepts. Why do we want a graph? So, and not a mesh. So let's imagine we want to create some sort of like operations in our like solids, right? So we have a tetrahedron and we want to truncate it because of some reason. So that would be very impractical with data structures like arrays of vertices or vertices and arrays of faces where we would need to find all the vertices that connect to this corner and then truncate them and so on. So using a graph is a very elegant way to perform these sort of like graph operations after all in the solids. It's also very easy to switch with this data structure from a graph to its dual. And I'll explain what a dual graph is and why it's important. And then finally, it's easy to execute Euler operations in it. This data structure, what's interesting in it is that the first class citizen in the structure is an edge, like not nodes or anything like it, only edges. The edges are directed. So you have E is an edge right on the bottom left image. If you call the sim method on it, you get the, uh, the edge uh, pointing at the different direction. And then the E road and inverse rotations are edges that belong to its dual graph. And again, I'll explain what a dual graph is later. It's really easy uh, we also with th these data structures to iterate across edges of a face. So for example, 
you could hit next or prev and you get a counterclockwise or a clockwise traversal of a face's edge. This is incredibly useful for lots of things, including Voronoi tessellations. Actually, the paper was targeting Voronoi tessellations. And then you have the Euler operations, which I won't go into detail to, which are on the bottom left side. But on the right side, what's interesting is to look at what dual graphs are. In this case, you have graphs like tetrahedron cube and dodecahedron, and then you have the pointed dotted lines are like the dual graphs for it. So what if we created a graph where each node of the graph replaces a face in the current graph? and then the edges are actually perpendicular to the edges of the original graph. So a dual graph is a graph that you take, basically transform the, the original graph by transforming every face into a node, and then every edge into a perpendicular edge to the original one. So the dual for a tetrahedron is a tetrahedron, and you get to see the other transformations there. Cool, so we, we talked about how uh, this creates really uneven trees, right? When you create the spanning trees on like all the connected faces, you get all these like really weird trees where like each node has only one child underneath it, and so it's very unbalanced. So Van Wyck explores this other technique where you create recursive subdivision of solids and then you get a more balanced kind of like tree structure. So in this case, you get to see that on the platonic solids, we have four faces on the tetrahedron, which is this one. Then you have six faces on the cube, which is this one. And then you have eight faces on the octahedron, that one, and then 20 faces on the icosahedron. And we cannot recursively subdivide the dodecahedron, which has 12 faces because we cannot create a uh, recursive subdivision of a hexagon into n other smaller hexagons. So we don't use that. This is a visual representation of these graphs. And then on the red lines, you get the cuts. In this, cu in this case, are, they're like randomly generated. And the blue lines are the folds across faces. So it's interesting to see, for example, on the icosahedron, how the folds are kind of like hexagonal shaped. And then on the cube, both cuts and folds are kind of like the, the same shape. So this provides way more balanced trees. And in a way, um, like in the previous projections, you got to see like how far the, every stripe was from the other one would tell you a bit more about the Tissot indicatrix. Here with the recursive subdivisions, you try to minimize that sort of like distortion that happens there. Another thing to uh, be aware of is that the original graph cannot be unfolded. So imagine that you have a cube, right? So a cube has eight edges. Now imagine that you have an unfolded cube. So there are many more edges there, right? Like you have to duplicate edges and, and, and nodes in order to get the unfolded cube. You have actually 14 nodes, unfolded cube, and you have eight nodes in the folded cube. I actually have a handwritten image on a napkin that shows you that. On the top right side, you get to see unfolded cube, 14 edges. And then on the bottom left, you get to see the folded cube, which only has four nodes, sorry, nodes, not edges. So in order to do that, you actually need to create a new graph, right? The unfoldable graph can be constructed by basically computing the maximal spanning tree of the dual graph. And then comes the unfolding challenge. So basically in order to unfold things without stretching stuff, we triangulate the faces. And then let's imagine that you have a face that is comprised of three nodes, P, Q, and R. And that's going to be your reference phase for the plane. Then let's imagine you have a fourth node, S, that connects with Q and R. Then you basically rotate that node uh, by the axis of QR to get it on the same plane. And then you do that recursively, and you get an unfolding of the Earth. Cool. So from there, Van Wyck keeps the same data structures, the polyhedra, and he starts thinking about optimal mappings. And so what are optimal mappings? So these are ways of finding, uh, ways of rotating the texture of the earth in ways that when you create cuts, you don't cut on land, you only cut on water. So you have a, like all the land is on the same piece. And so he finds that on the tetrahedron, you get an optimal mapping, but on the others, you get an almost open, optimal mapping. The way we create this is by slowly rotating by three axes and one degree the solids, and mapping them to the texture, and then sampling 25 times every edge to see if it cuts the land in any of those places. And so you, you compute a score for each one of these things, and then you find the minima for that rotation. And it creates, like, uh, you know, the unfolding of the cube, apparently it's not perfect, but it looks almost perfect to me. And uh, I've been looking into, like, creating 
actual physical cubes and, and other solids based on that. Finally, he kind of like continues with this idea of like, uh, you know, cutting on water versus cutting on land. And so he kind of like explores this idea of like geography line meshes. And so for this, he creates a completely different sets of graphs that follow the topology of the land and the water. And so he creates these two cuts, one that cuts in the middle of oceans and then one that cuts in the middle of uh, land. So you get to see the sea line and then the coastline of the earth in that unfolding. In order to do that, actually he cites different papers. You need to go implement another paper to implement his technique. But I think it's a really interesting approach that can be generalized for any types of you know, cuts and folds that you'd like to do. Starting with the top right image, he creates a distance field from any point to the mass, right? And so it's not just a blurred image, but it's an image that's blurred in a way that the center of South America and the center of the Antarctic are the same brightness. So it, he kind of really computes the amount of mass that's around every point to make it really even. And then from that, you get a vector field, right? So, so the gradients of these things can tell you like, how to go to a place that has more mass or how to go to a place that has more water. And so he creates these sort of like streamlines from these vector fields that you get to see on the two bottom images. One that follows the contours of the land and another one that's like perpendicular to those. And then finally on the bottom left image, what we do is we compute the intersection of these two streamlines and we create a mesh of that. So basically this mesh follows the topology of the land. And you could do this with anything, right? If you have a drawing of anything, I'm trying to think what to use next for this. Uh, you could create a mesh that follows that topology. What's interesting in this paper though, is that he tried multiple techniques to do this. So the first one is the one that I implemented, but then he wasn't convinced about that one because that required a lot of cleanup to do in terms of like finding convex faces and then triangulating and cleaning up the streamlines. So he tried a different approach using curvature tensor fields which he didn't like. And so that left a kind of like an open question in the paper of like, okay, could there be an even better approach to it? And we do a similar approach to the first one, although we do some tweaks to ensure that we have convex faces that are a little bit, tiny bit more elegant than the, the thing he'd done. And the output is fairly similar. So on the bottom of the image, you get to see his approach and on the top, it's our approach and it's, it's fairly similar. Cool, so I've been thinking about future work. So he provides a framework for you to explore different map projections. So now that we have this physical model and we have different ideas that we can try out, what other things could we do? One idea that came to mind, well, first of all, you need to wait eight seconds for the thing to load. So probably like loading stuff faster would be better. But the other stuff is other approaches to visualizing these map projections. One of them could be parametrizing the center of the transform so that, you know, the Mercator projection, if you approach to the equator, things are its real size. But if you go up or down, like north or south, you'll see like the area distortion, right? So you could actually rotate the globe so that the center of that projection is not the equator, but some other like meridian or, or parallel or whatnot. So that is parametrizing the center of the transform. That could bring a new whole set of map projections. The other one could be using other types of solids for optimal mappings. The other one could be, you know, doing some other type of things with geography aligned meshes, like, I don't know, cutting on tectonic plates or whatnot. And then the other one could be trying to 3D print some of this stuff or build uh, something that's uh, physical out of it. So on the first one, changing the center of the projection actually like gives you uh, interesting results but common ones on the common projections. Note that this is not just a displacement of the texture, but this is actually a recomputing the center of that projection so that you can have you know, other places as simuth of your map projection, for example. We've probably seen this in the past with D3. I don't think we've seen it with the uh, subdivision. So it's interesting to see how, how much of the land is affected depending on which area they are of this physical model. It's also very trippy to see this like thing rotate. And that's pretty much what it does when you are computing the optimal mapping for the solids, right? It's rotating this thing in all different ways until it finds the optimal mapping. The other thing is I took out the data for it, uh, put it in Blender, added some thickness, added some displacement mapping based on 
the texture of the earth and then did some 3D printing. I don't know if you've used Shapeways at all. But you send something to Shapeways and then you need to wait three weeks and you're like very excited when the packet comes back and then you don't like your prototype and you need to iterate it again. So it's like a very slow process, but it's somewhat fulfilling to be able to touch something that you've actually created. And then on the top side, we're working on seeing if we can like engrave some of this stuff and create actual physical objects with polyhedra that we can unfold. This is a failed example, but worth going. So this is trying to create cuts on tectonic plates. So you get the original image at the bottom, then we find cuts across these different plates. And I think that the challenge with this is that it's not very intuitive for us to know where the tectonic plates are. So the unfolding create, like, becomes very counterintuitive for us. Like, why are we cutting here instead of elsewhere? We could use like the color for the plates to show why we're cutting there, but I feel it's not super informative. If you have any other ideas of meshes that could be cut in different ways, let me know. Thank you very much.